Welcome to Stream of Conscience, brought to you by Democracy for America, Fairfield County, where we believe that change is possible and you can make it happen. I'm your host, John Hartwell. Our guest today is David Kouris, Vice President at the Regional Plan Association, America's oldest and most distinguished independent urban research and advocacy group. RPA prepares long-range plans and policies to guide the growth and development of the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut metropolitan region, and David is director of the Connecticut office, managing the organization's portfolio of research and planning in our state and in New York's Hudson Valley. Focusing on smart growth and transit-oriented development, he currently manages several projects and research initiatives throughout the region that combine his background in urban design and sustainability with his devotion to public process and climate action. David, welcome to Stream of Conscience. Thanks very much for having me. Well, so the Regional Plan Association has been around since 1922. Yes. But it's an organization that I think most people really don't know much about. So give us a bit of background about, about the organization. Sure. Um, well, we're rather unique in how we came about. A uh, group of business leaders and uh, civic leaders in the New York region came together in the 20s uh, to chart a course for the future of the region, recognizing that even at that time, the challenges and the opportunities facing New York City had bled beyond its borders, and therefore was out of the complete control of just that one city's government. So they knew that they were gonna have to begin to forge the partnerships uh, between municipalities, between New York City and its neighbors, and the partnerships between the public and private and civic sectors. Um, and so uh, getting together in the 20s, uh, they created a blueprint really for growth uh, that would uh, lay the foundation for generations of prosperity. Um, and it's, it's really an interesting story uh, pertinent for our time because uh, when the plan was released, uh, it was merely months before the stock exchange crash. Mm. And they were frankly laughed out of the room in many instances because right. they were proposing billions of dollars of investment at a time when the, cr the country was facing you know, its first financial crisis. Um, yet when the nation embarked on a stimulus plan, and, uh, and engaged uh, the, the citizens of this nation in a, in a strategy to jumpstart the economy. We were the one place that had a future mapped out. We were the one place that had uh, you know, billions of dollars of shovel-ready projects um, <laughs> that, were, that were waiting to be implemented. And we're talking about uh, during the Roosevelt administration. Yes, now. The yes. stimulus would have been the WPA and for example, the, the Merritt Parkway was built at that time. Exactly. The Hudson Parkway. Exactly. The, the parkways of the region, mm -hmm. uh, many of the bridges and, and tunnels mm -hmm. and uh, the, the airports that you know, we couldn't imagine the New York metropolitan region existing without. Um, and we've, you know, we've really been living off of the benefits of those investments for several generations now. And the ability of people at that time to actually project into the future and say, this is the way we need to do. Yes. To do what, what we need to do to grow. Yeah, it was uh, a very, you know, very hopeful time with, yeah. uh, with a long future uh, out ahead of them. And so we did one plan in 1929, um, and that's what I just described. And then uh, we try and do a plan every time there's a, uh, a region shaping or a nation shaping uh, transformation uh, mm -hmm. on the horizon. So we did our second plan in the 1960s, which was really looking at the, uh, the decentralization of the region. People were leaving Manhattan, companies were leaving New York City um, you know, by, by the hundreds and thousands. And so we, we put together a strategy for how to strengthen the regional centers, places like Stamford, mm -hmm. um, that were able to involve into business centers, employment centers, uh, while, uh, while you know, kind of forming some, some sense of concentration outside of New York City. Um, and frankly, we were probably more successful um, than, than we should have been in fostering decentralization. Mm. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, we saw a lot of sprawling development eating up uh, the countryside, sure. um, land that we need for our water supply, for our air supply, for our recreation. And so we did a third plan in, in 1996 called A Region at Risk. Uh, which highlighted many of those challenges that if we were to continue on those same trends uh, where we would be in 2020, 2025, and, and the future looked pretty bleak. 
Um, thankfully, we've made some major investments in uh, transit infrastructure and transportation systems. We've seen um, now over the past few decades the revitalization of some of our downtowns. We've seen transformations in places like Bridgeport. And, and while it's not where it needs to be or where it could be, um, it's really, you know, significantly uh, more successful than it was even even several years ago and we're now actually embarking on a process to create the fourth plan um, that will be a, a process over the course of the ne next several years which is really focused on um, you know what what is the future of New York City in a in a global uh, you know, global economy um, and and how do we better connect to our neighbors so that we can leverage uh, the the potential that exists in this corridor from Boston to Washington D.C. to be one of the most uh, competitive and and prosperous and efficient regions in the world. Um, right now we're dealing with you know a lot of the the challenges associated with being the densest agglomerate of population and employment on the continent and we're not really getting many of the benefits. But there are opportunities there. So, absolutely. So when I was looking on your website for example uh, one of the things that I came across was a report that you published uh, last March uh, looking at the Connecticut census and uh, what struck me immediately was that uh, the growth that seems to be in Connecticut uh, was centered primarily around the New Haven Hartford corridor. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, we've been talking about um, increasing the train capacity along that corridor, uh, putting in a real commuter system that run from New Haven to Hartford and per per perhaps all the way up to Springfield, Massachusetts. So what would be the benefit of doing that? Why are people thinking about trains in a corridor where we already have um, it's not the Merritt Parkway up there, it's the uh, Wilbur Cross, the Wilbur Cross yeah. but it, it's an extension of the Merritt. And we also have I-91 running mm -hmm. straight up through that region. So why do we need more trains? Sure. Um, well, first let me say a little bit about what's embodied in these trends, why we're seeing people moving to places like the New Haven-Springfield Corridor and, and cities like New Haven, which was saw the largest population gain of any municipality in the state. Um, you know, our nation and, and our region and, and our state are changing significantly demographically. Mm. Uh, we're seeing uh, increasing amounts of empty nesters, mm -hmm. increasing amounts of young single person households, young professionals waiting to get married later, having kids later. Mm -hmm. So this rise in uh, smaller households mm -hmm. is increasing. And what we're seeing is the type of households that those uh, that those people demand, uh, empty nesters, young professionals, they're looking for places that really have a strong sense of community, mm -hmm. where you're not reliant on the car for every single trip, where you can walk and meet up with a friend at a cafe or walk to the corner store to get some, you know, some milk or, or some groceries. And there are you know, we're lucky in Connecticut, frankly, because we have a lot of communities that offer that kind of lifestyle right. because of when the state developed, you know, because we developed in an area prior to the automobile uh, in many of our communities around rail, around walkable neighborhoods, uh, we have a, a pretty good selection for that type of community compared to, say, regions like uh, metropolitan Denver or Dallas right. that are struggling now to catch up in creating those kind of places from scratch. So we're seeing increasing increasing demand for, I, I don't want to say necessarily urban living, but living that has the kind of urban amenities. It can be small towns, it can be rural communities, but have that strong sense of community and strong sense of downtown and, and don't require driving an hour each day. Um, now, a lot of those communities are in southwestern Connecticut here in Stamford and Norwalk and Fairfield and Bridgeport. Unfortunately, a lot of those places are really expensive. Norwalk to Stamford is the most expensive rental market in the United States of America. Is that true? That's true. We wow. have this problem where we have increasing demand yeah. and a constrained supply because yeah. many of the communities along the coast have said no to higher density development, said no to rental development. So places like Stamford and Norwalk are really um, trying to meet the supply for an entire region. Um, so because of that high cost, uh, people are starting to look at places like the valley, the Naugatuck Valley, Derby, Ansonia, Shelton, uh, Naugatuck, or places in the 91 corridor, places that you know have all these ingredients but haven't seen the kind of demand mm -hmm. over the last you know, 20, 30 years that we've seen in southwestern Connecticut and therefore are slightly more affordable. And these areas that we're talking about, the valley, for example, have a long history of small industrial 
uh, capacity, uh, tool and die shops and mm -hmm. things like that, high precision things, where Connecticut has lost ground um, and so a lot of those areas were depressed, whereas the areas along the coast were places where people working in primarily in the financial services sector or in areas that fed off the pri you know, financial services like right. accounting and marketing and, and you know, all of, of those kinds of white collar jobs. That's all been concentrated primarily along the coast. Right. Um, and I think what we see in the corridor from New Haven up to, to Hartford is uh, the possibility of a resurgence in biotech uh, and, and other kinds of, of, of uh, new technology growth uh, that you know is being fostered by some of the stem cell research projects that the Governor Rell launched or uh, the new project that, that Governor Malloy is doing with the, with the hospitals. Absolutely. Trying to draw all of that together and, and bring in really a different kind of growth. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, f how we phase economic development in the state is going to be very interesting. Certainly some of the short-term play is just better connecting Central Connecticut with Metropolitan New York and Metropolitan Boston. Right. You know, right now we're kind of living on the edge of two really strong, thriving metropolitan areas. So how do we create uh, infrastructure improvements so that we go from being the edge of two metropolitan areas to the center of something larger? Right. If all of a sudden it becomes possible for people living in New Haven or Hartford or any place in between dual income households to have jobs, one that's tied to the metropolitan area of Boston and one more tied to New York, all of a sudden Connecticut becomes a really uh, attractive place to live because you're taking advantage of so much more opportunity. So that's kind of a short term play. And then the, the question really, the opportunity is how do we translate that into longer term economic development in central Connecticut, in the valley, that's not just dependent on a connection to these larger areas, right. but is really something independent and thriving on its own. Um, you know, we have we have significant significant advantages. Certainly, costs. Um, you know, real estate is a lot more uh, affordable in those places. So if you're only dependent on getting to New York or Boston one day a week or two days a week for meeting, all of a sudden it's a really attractive place for back office location and secondary office location. Um, we have obviously the incredibly skilled workforce um, that grew up in these industries. And I think, um, you know, there's a, real, there's a real opportunity there when we combine the, the quality of life that we see in these communities with the built fabric that uh, is potentially a lot more sustainable because it's less automobile dependent and then the high quality workforce that we have populating these communities. Um, some key investments like the New Haven Springfield line which serve to draw Connecticut closer to the orbit of Boston and New York could really be the catalyst uh, for the kind of growth that we need. Well and as I we were discussing before the show uh, the, you know right now the economy and the tax base of Connecticut, especially the income tax base, is primarily based here in Fairfield County. Uh, I think we have 25 percent of the population and we pay 40 percent of the taxes, something, something along mm -hmm. that line. What that means is that when Hartford needs more money, they look to us. And of course that's resented down here. Uh, the, the, uh, I think the way out of that is by growing another part of the state so that there are there's geographic uh, diversity here. There's two regions of the state that, where there's a strong economy rather than one. And at the same time, to move away from the kind of dependence that we've had on financial services and the bonuses that are there, instead to, to branch out into other new technologies, uh, like I said before, like stem cell and, and biotech and clean energy, those sorts of things. Absolutely. We certainly have a, a, a jump start on clean energy uh, right. with the fuel cell industry in Connecticut and, and a lot of other smaller innovative things happening yeah. um, in places like Bridgeport and, and Stanford and, and up around the universities. Um, so how we, um, how we seed the growth of those small companies um, so that they can flourish into the next UTC uh, or the next global globally competitive company is, is really key. And a big piece of that is ensuring that we have the kinds of communities that are both affordable and attractive to the workforce um, that will fuel innovation and fuel growth in those, in those sectors. Um, that's been one of the biggest problems um, that we've seen as we try and attract new companies to the state uh, is, is either A, finding housing or, or quality communities for their workforce, and B, finding
providing employment for their spouses. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a real uh, snowball that needs to take place and, and I believe really strongly that it starts first and foremost with making sure that we have communities and neighborhoods that are attractive, affordable, and well positioned to, um, to weather the uncertainty that we face in terms of energy prices and, and oil. So I know you've done some work in, with Bridgeport um, around environmental things, and there's a Be Green program. Yes, yeah? that's correct. Um, how does that work in? Because that's, that's, I'm sure, not as much economic development as it is um, cleaning up the environment and, and creating a better, more livable city. Yeah, well, and, and that is economic development because okay. the more attractive that we can make Bridgeport as a place for investment by individuals and by companies, uh, the better off they'll be with their tax base. Um, and, and the more efficient we can become, uh, the more money we save households and individuals on their tax bills for the city. So, you know, the mayor certainly likes to say that this is be green, and green is just as much about dollars as it is about environment. And really, first and foremost, it's about redefining the city. Mm -hmm. um, the city has such a stigma attached to it. it you know, it's brown, industrial. Right. Uh, it's really, you know, seen as, as having its its prime past uh, when you know, I believe strongly that its prime is still ahead of it. Um, all the ingredients that made Bridgeport successful in the middle of the 20th century are the exact same ingredients that we need for successful communities in the 21st century. Um, so while Be Green 2020, which is the initiative, um, is very much focused on things like cleaning brownfields, cleaning rivers, planting trees, um, you know, all the things that people typically think of as green. Uh, it also includes things like making the city's buildings more energy efficient. Mm. So they're not spending as much every year on electricity and that's money that can go directly into savings to homeowners on their tax bill. Right. Or things like green job training so that when we do uh, you know, create more weatherization in the state or uh, retrofit more buildings to be more efficient or train more people to, uh, to drive our buses and our trains, that the residents of the city of Bridgeport have an access to that, that growing employment. Um, and it's also things like um, transportation, uh, making sure that the city is um, taking advantage of its connection to New York, its connection to New Haven and Hartford, mm -hmm. um, but also um, taking advantage of the fact that it is incredibly walkable and it is bikeable and it has a, a robust bus network. And so uh, we don't need to be so reliant on automobiles and, and gas. And it sounds like when we're talking about you know new transportation and fixing old buildings so that they're energy efficient, mm -hmm. we're talking about money. You know, we, you know, where do we get, how much do we need and where do we get it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A lot of this has, has significant price tags. Um, on transportation, um, you know, I think we need to think uh, very strategically about how we prioritize investments and how we finance those investments. Um, we've been very reliant on federal resources mm -hmm. um, for a long time here in Connecticut. About 70% of our transportation spending over the past few years has been from federal federal monies. Um, that is certainly going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, the federal pie is, is likely going to shrink um, and if uh, we think that we can continue to get a significant share of that, um, we're mistaken. As we begin to shift towards more competitive programs uh, and we see other regions in the country shifting towards more local revenue. So if we look at places like Denver that have done uh, local sales tax, regional sales tax, mm -hmm. or places like Dallas which do something called value capture, uh, which I'll, I'll explain in a moment, uh, we're going to need to think similarly about how to raise revenue locally. Um, value capture is really interesting. It basically says when the public sector makes an investment in transportation infrastructure, you add value mm -hmm. to the surrounding properties. Right. Uh, we can see this uh, in, in the coming years in Fairfield. We just built a new train station. Yes. As soon as that train opens, I can guarantee that the property values within walking distance will increase and you'll start to see those industrial properties be repurposed mm -hmm. as residential and office properties. So the public sector can put mechanisms into place to capture a portion of that value. 
And absolutely, the private sector and the property owners nearby should be able to reap those benefits. But for the public sector to make significant investments and not get a return is, is frankly foolish. Uh, when, um, you know, when we, frankly, the, the private sector benefited for generations on the public investment in the, in the highway system. Right. Uh, every time you built a new interchange, that added value to the surrounding properties, and it was a windfall. It was a windfall for those people that were lucky enough to have owned the, the, the farmland that existed at an interchange. Um, so there's mechanisms to make sure that the investments we make create some payback, um, but we also need to be really strategic and prioritize. We can't be building um, highways out to uh, agricultural land that we don't want to see developed. Um, we can't be investing in uh, large intersections in urban areas that are meant to have traffic flow more smoothly but don't add value to surrounding properties. Um, and so I think we'll see in the coming years uh, a new approach to how we decide which investments to make based on the value that gets created. And it's not just economic value. It's social benefits, it's environmental benefits. I think we'll see uh, an increasing uh, utilization of, of triple bottom line accounting, balancing economic, environmental, and social impacts so that we know that the investments we make as a society are those that are actually best best suited to create widespread benefit and not just isolated benefit to one group of people or to one neighborhood or one area uh, of the economy. So you guys are doing a tremendous amount of work and uh, if people want to keep up with that, if they want to participate in what you're doing, what do they do? Yeah, so our website is www.rpa.org. Right. Uh, we have uh, Twitter feeds, we have uh, Facebook and Connecticut RPA as well. Um, and that's where you can get most of the information about what's going on. Um, and other than that, you know, just uh, kind of keep, keep track in, in Bridgeport. Be Green 2020 uh, has a website as well. And your office is in Stanford. Our office is in Stanford. Feel free to stop by or come by. We're in Landmark Square, um, and we're always interested in talking with people about how we best position the communities of Connecticut uh, for a prosperous and sustainable future. Well, your website has a tremendous amount of information on it, lots of studies for people who uh, like to look at these things, and, yeah. and they have uh, you know, great graphs and, and good ideas. And um, you know, it's, it's a terrific that somebody's out there thinking these things through because otherwise I have the feeling there's so much short-term thinking going on. Uh, we need people who've been in the business for a while and who take the long view. David, it's terrific to have you come today. Thank Great. you so much for all the your work you're doing. Um, I'd love to have you back again and talk some more about rail because there's a lot more to, to talk Fantastic. about. Fantastic. Yeah, we'd love to come back and thanks for having me. Thank you very much. Cheers. And now, a stream of conscience commentary with Ann Galloway. All great civilizations eventually fail, and Darwin may have provided the best explanation. Humans have more developed brains, but like other animals, we often operate according to survival of the fittest or eat or be eaten. When the chips are down, animal instincts seem to trump humane values. Today's America is experiencing class warfare that could spell its death knell. The elites have become very clever using well-researched propaganda techniques to mask a huge shift in resource allocation from the many to the few. And in persuading the public that unprovoked wars and mass brutality conducted by our military and security personnel is a patriotic endeavor. But consider the huge profits wars generate for industries that traffic in weapons and fossil fuels. Consider the horrific human toll, or for that matter, the effects of on, on our federal budget. The war of choice in Iraq and the endless occupation of Afghanistan have killed or maimed hundreds of thousands, including close to 100,000 Iraqi civilians, more than 5,000 American and NATO dead, plus 320,000 military personnel who have come home with serious, lasting injuries. These wars have cost taxpayers more than a trillion dollars that could have been used for job creation and infrastructure repair that could have helped keep teachers in classrooms with their pensions intact and provided better health care for every citizen. Yet sanitized reporting has masked the horrific human toll caused by our so-called democracy. The military industrial foxes are fully in charge of the chickens. The mega wealthy and those in Washington who do their bidding 
are without any social conscience. Supported by most of our mainstream media, they are determined this time to prevail. These special interests now have a virtual monopoly over most of what we read, see, and hear. The excesses of Rupert Murdoch's empire have made the headlines, but Murdoch is just the tip of the iceberg. Five companies in the United States own over half of all radio and television stations, newspapers, and magazines. Locally, only the tiny Hersom Acorn Weeklies and the Norwalk Hour operate outside of this monolith. Even The Current, our state's largest newspaper, shares space in its newsroom with Fox. A clear example of media collusion with moneyed elites is the lack of coverage of the Wall Street protests. The public editor of the New York Times has admitted that they have had a number of complaints from readers. He might have added that when his paper finally got around to writing a story, it was biased and snarky. Most of the media today provides cover for our 21st century robber barons who, like Murdoch, are today's equivalent of the businessmen and bankers who plundered this country in the 19th century and not for the first time have put us in a deep financial hole. Today's robber barons, having learned from past experience, do not intend to be restrained this time. They and their allies write our legislation. The laws of the jungle may look different in modern society, but it has become increasingly clear that similar rules continue to apply. It is our job to put these animal spirits back in their cages and resurrect the American dream before we all get eaten. This has been a Stream of Conscience commentary. I'm Ann Galloway. Thanks for watching. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. If you live in the town served by Cablevision from Norwalk, you can catch our show every Wednesday on Channel 88 at 6.30 p.m. If you're interested in learning more about progressive political action in Fairfield County, please check out our Democracy for America group. We meet the first Wednesday of the month, 7 to 9 p.m. at the Silver Star Diner in Norwalk. We always welcome new members. Remember, change is possible, and you can make it happen. This has been Stream of Conscience, and I'm your host, John Hartwell. We hope to see you again soon.